which you might argue was wider, now wider access, but why doesn't this get, since it's produced by, you know, essentially Warner Brothers, HBO, Time Warner, why isn't this a product? Well, it's because of the story that it tells, right? So, a bit of history. Just focusing on Los Angeles. The Spook Punters and, LS and the LAPD versus the black community. So the Spook Hunters were a white racist youth gang in Southgate, California, active from the 1940s to the 1950s. The gang was founded as a reaction to the growing African-American population in the neighboring city of Los Angeles. Now, when historically you heard about South Central, South Central was organized around Central Boulevard, Central Avenue in Los Angeles, which is where near the railroad line coming in from the South. So a lot of black people coming from the South, migrating during the war, would come in and basically settle on one side of the railroad tracks, and Central Avenue was the dividing line beyond which black people could not move west of. Now by 1960, when my family moved from San Francisco to what, now, what was called South Central is now called South LA, we lived at 48th and Dinker, which was considerably west of Central. And there were a few white families, but the majority of the white families had left. So in 1960, it was a majority black neighborhood, but not totally black. So spook hunters, their goal centered around work against integration and for racial segregation in communities. So for example, the, what used to be Watts, what used to be like Imperial, certain parks, were mostly, they wanted to keep those white. And they would actually attack kids going to parks and families going to parks and in school. And sometimes uh, they would be, if there was backup, it was supplied by the LAPD because the, at the time the LAPD was also recruiting heavily from ex-Southern military folks, Klansmen in the South to come join the police department to basically enforce these racial um, barrier lines. Also with the LA, the LA County Sheriff's Office. So, LAPD and or LA County Sheriffs, like many police organizations in the 50s, to the present, often recruited or at least did not screen for white supremacists or white southerners or white ex-military to fill their ranks, particularly to police minority neighborhoods. I did see on CNN where there was a white police chief from the South that was actually asking the question, have you ever been part of a white supremacist organization? which was interesting, but that really had never been done before. And certainly our own local experience with the Klan in 1936 after the Register Guards said that the Klan had disappeared in the state, the Oregonian reported that the Klan had 16,000 members statewide, Eugene was gonna be at state headquarters and they were gonna focus on law enforcement and politics. So this is not a new agenda for them. And there's a reason why you focus on law enforcement and politics. All right? So LAPD, as well as the sheriffs, often back, back supremacist gangs like the spook hunters, as well as accepted bribes, ran protection rackets against black community members and businesses along Central Avenue, which was like basically like Harlem. Jazz clubs, et cetera, et cetera. So, black community attempts to rid the community of the influence of illegal drugs, gambling, prostitution, corruption, either by legal means or illegal means was thwarted or met with organized resistance. Well, how do you call the cops on the cops, for one? Two, if you're going to resist drugs and illegal businesses and you can't depend on the police department to do that, then anything that you would do would be against the law, right? Because you can't take the law into your own hands. How would you deal with illegal activity? So for example, the Italian mafia, 
controlled the drug trade with some few exceptions and were allowed free reign in black communities without any law enforcement at the local or federal level to stop this activity. So for example, if you watch the first Godfather movie, I mean, Don Corleone basically says, you know, what are we, how are we gonna, who are we gonna sell heroin to? We'll sell it to the niggers. That is not Hollywood. That is a historical fact reflected in Hollywood. During this time, especially in New York City, but er every place there was an illegal drug trade, but let's use New York City as an example, the mafia was allowed to sell drugs with the full knowledge of both the police department and the FBI, who would have jurisdiction because the FBI deals with international and interstate crime. They were allowed to operate within Harlem and other cities untouched by the FBI. With their full knowledge, all right? Not only that, but there was... Yeah, and of course, there's corruption and bribery. So, within the black community, and this is what I'm talking about, extra legal, not that it's illegal, but if you cannot depend on law enforcement or mainstream to protect you from criminal <coughs> organizations, you need to create your own solution. So to that, the Nation of Islam and eventually Black Panthers and us, as well as the Uhuru Movement and others, organized to combat drugs and illegal activity using what I'll refer to as culturally appropriate responses. Details to follow. So, Against, you know, so you asked about, for example, th this is part of the talk that I would have given at the gang conference if they had asked me to, but they would not necessarily. Well, I, I got the paper out of the, I read the article. Yes. Yeah. Personally, the Register Guardian, uh, I thought you were going to go speak on it, and you were, you were omitted from the article, so I thought something happened. Yes. I was omitted from the speakers list, too. So, black street self-defense organizations, i.e. street gangs, depending on who you're talking about, street gangs. So, I grew up in Los Angeles when the only gangs were the Slossons and the businessmen and the gladiators. I learned how to make a Slosson S. Let's see, can I still do it? You make an S out of that. Oh, yeah. Right. That's a stoner S. It's not a. It was a Slauson S. You young people, you don't have any history. Anyway, <laughs> Slauson S. Okay, stoner S. <laughs> huh? Go ahead. You can finish it. Not that I'm a stoner. That's all right. All right. So the Slossons organized against the spook hunters and eventually, of course, the LAPD. Eventually in Los Angeles and Northern California, Oakland particularly became organizing cells of the Black Panther and of uh, the US organization. But the ambassadors of the party, they'll talk about, right, yes, exactly. Ambassadors of the party, they'll talk about how the Slossons and the businessmen and the gladiators became organizing cores for both the Black Panthers and us. So, Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, founded in Oakland, California by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale in response to continued pattern of police brutality, which originally and most famously as it depicted in All Power of the People, they talk about armed patrols organized to watch police operate in the community. Now, they're basically saying, so both Huey and Bobby Seale were college educated. Bobby Seale actually worked for Alameda County. He actually used, you know, Alameda County, Xerox, I mean, many of you aren't old enough to remember Xerox, but rather, or mimeographs, but actually used the reproductive facilities of the county to basically do leaflets for the Black Panther Party. So the armed patrols was basically, look, we have a Second Amendment right to bear arms in public. And so they're not going to be shooting at the police, but when the police are making a stop or an arrest, 
we're going to basically be standing across the street because the police don't want you near them, but you can ga peaceably gather across the street and we'll witness what you're doing. Because you ain't going to do a Rodney King. Now, Rodney King was still like 20, 30 years in the future, but basically what happened to Rodney King was standard run-ins for many police departments. Myself, growing up in Los Angeles, a black person stood a 50-50 chance of surviving a routine traffic stop from LAPD. I tell you about Johnny Cochran, one of Johnny Cochran's first cases. Like you know about OJ, right? Leonard Deadweiler. Yes? No? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Leonard Deadweiler. Leonard Deadweiler was from Georgia, black man from Georgia. And in Georgia, if you have a pregnant wife and she goes into labor, you can tie a white flag to the aerial of your car and if a police officer sees that, they will stop you and then speed you down the road to the hospital in Georgia. Now, one of the issues that was happening in Los Angeles because of segregation, black people, it was legal for to discriminate against black people in hospitals. In fact, for example, in Eugene, Ms. Lily Parker talked about she was the first publicly acknowledged black person born in Sacred Heart. Except that her birth certificate says she's white. So if you've seen Lily, I mean, she's my color. Her mama is my color. So for them to put down white on the birth certificate was basically to maintain a fiction black people aren't born in the hospital because it was legal to discriminate. Right? So, very similar thing to happen in Los Angeles. So, Deadweiler lived in Watts. The nearest hospital was County USC downtown. He's traveling on the Harbor Freeway with the white flag tied to his aerial. He's speeding. His wife's in labor. He gets stopped by a highway patrolman trying to explain that you know, my wife's in labor. Highway patrolman asks for his ID. He starts to pull out his wallet. Blam, shot dead. In front of the seat, next to his pregnant wife. Goes to trial for wrongful death, justifiable homicide. Okay, which was actually standard. Go for your wallet. This is Leonard Deadweiler. So, uh, let's see. Google can give you it. It's in the 60s. So Johnny Cochran was a prosecutor for the, for the city and basically took on the wrongful death case for, the dead, for his widow. Lost it, but that's when he basically started his career in terms of dealing with you know, high profile defendants. Not just Michael Jackson and OJ, but Leonard Deadwell. Right? So, the reason you have the Black Panther Party, go back to slide, please. Armed patrols are organized to watch police operate in the community is because the police are killing people under the color of the badge, which is not surprising given that, you know, where they're recruiting from. They're not necessarily going to be people that are going to be sympathetic to black people. So the reason that I talk about the Black Panther Party, and this is, comes from a, a study done in Stanford, is the Black Panther Party as a model is not just a bunch of black people walking around with guns trying to keep, po basically trying to stop police brutality. There are 85 community programs that came out of party activities. So contrary to, for example, mainstream historical accounts, which only talk about the Panthers' militant stances against police, like you know, i.e. in the armed uppity Negro, or less polite sobriquets or terms, armed ignorant thugs, 
the Panthers created viable alternatives, many of which inspired others to emulate them. And that was part of the danger, really. Okay, so the point was not to show how the system wasn't working, because that's obvious, the system wasn't working, but to create systems that actually serve people in a way that empowered them without making them subservient. Now that's dangerous, but you'll see in some of these social programs, the reason these existed is because mainstream society did not have any of these programs. And now they're a standard feature, though under attack. But they started, with, for example, within Oakland and then nationwide where the Panthers were uh, as part of uh, these informal community programs. So for example, starting in Alameda County. Alameda County Volunteer Bureau Worksite, benefit counseling that is for either veteran benefits or uh, unemployment benefits. Black Student Alliance is like a BSU, Child Development Center, consumer education classes, you do financial literacy for loans, community health classes, East for example number eight, East Oakland Center for Independent Living, that's for if you're disabled, community pantry, free food program, drug and alcohol abuse awareness program, which also included free heroin detox. Drama classes, class, uh, things for disabled people, drill teams, free ambulance program, a free ambulance program. Free clothing, free breakfast for children, free dental, free employment, free food program, free fil film series, free furniture, free health clinics, free housing cooperatives, food co-ops, free optometry, free pest control, So when you think, of, look at all these different things that are now, if they're taken up at all, taken up by government. This was before there was any government institution doing these things. Liberation schools, martial arts. So for example, there was a um, Black Panther Party in Eugene. And this is a statement uh, found online by Jaja, who I interviewed at least over the phone. The Eugene, Oregon chapter of the Black Panther Party started in 1968 and ended around 1970. Uh, so he's fairly frank about his analysis. So one of the things he talks about, it had a profound effect, and now again, consider the source. So I'm not discounting what he's saying. There's some other folks that may disagree with this. I'm not necessarily one of them, I wasn't there. Had a profound effect, impact on the city of Eugene. The students of the University of Oregon and the small number of African Americans that were born or lived in Eugene most of their lives. Most importantly was how the BPP influenced the black students at the U of O. Black Panther Party grew out of the Black Student Union of the U of O. Black students had issues that primarily dealt with the university community racism and academics. This left a void in the overall struggle of the small Eugene ineffective black community. The BPP occupied this hold with community-based programs. Elmer and Aaron Dixon headed the Seattle chapter of the BPP. They came down to Eugene to help organize the Eugene chapter. They left three Seattle members in Eugene to support the development of the Eugene chapter of the BPP. Eugene, Oregon is a small white community with a population that had very little or no interaction with black people. Issues regarding racism, renting apartments, shopping downtown, dealing with Eurocentric curricula in public schools and other black community related problems were looked at and dealt with with no prior experience. BPP established a few community survival projects. These projects were located off the U of O campus and focused on the poor people of Eugene because the BPP had an overall philosophy of looking at issues 
from a class analysis and not only a race analysis, these projects serve the local poor community, black and non-black people. In point of fact, the free breakfast program that the Panthers run in Eugene serve white kids, nearly exclusively. Because look, they're poor. This is not a race thing. It's like the system, kids are going to school hungry. This is why we have a free breakfast program in all our programs nationwide, from the Panthers' point of view. Here, it's the majority white community and the majority of whites are poor. Uh, yeah, we're not gonna discriminate. These projects were free breakfast program that served 20 to 30 young children every day, a liberation school that focused on African and African American history, and some of the untrue accounts of Eurocentric academic curricula. Public speaker program that participated in demonstrations, rallies on Vietnam, racism, or all the other isms. These speaker programs also tried to educate the greater Eugene community on the goals and philosophy of the Black Panther Party. Membership at its height was 18 to 20 members with 10 to 15 underground members. BPP had a lot of support from many whites at the U of O and in the community. The core members of the Eugene chapter were from Compton. Most had a pre-Panther relationship with each other that went back to elementary school. Most core members knew each other's families, i.e. mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers. All BP members had experienced racism in Eugene that primed them to join such a revolutionary organization. Most core members were brought to or influenced to move to Eugene from the leadership members of the BPP, Howard and Tommy Anderson. However, most moved to Eugene before the start of the BPP. Howard Anderson was captain. He was the first person from Compton to move to Eugene in 65 after working in the southern United States in Mississippi and Alabama with CORE and SNCC. 66, he convinced his younger brother, Tommy, to move to Eugene and attend the U of O. So Tommy is dead job. The Eugene chapter developed a very good supportive relationship with other revolutionary organizations. Some of these organizations were as follows. Patriot Party, Euro-Americans that focused on poor whites. The head of this organization was a man called Preacher Man. The Eugene chapter was organized by Chuck Armsbury and his wife. Brown Berets, headed by a small group of Chicanos from Los Angeles, with Ray Verdugo and the Eugene as their Eugene chapter head. They organized resistance to the exploitation of the Chicano community in Eugene and other migrant farming communities in surrounding areas. Brown Berets eventually became uh, Mecha, and they are the ones that also started what was then called Chicano Affairs on 13th Street and later became Central Latino Americana, which exists to this day. Give you a bit of perspective. Asian student organizers that focused on racism, stereotyping, and other re issues related to students of Asian descent, Ellen Bepp and Sandra Moroka were the contact people. So one, one of the things right off the bat you can see with the party is that they're expanding beyond the black community into doing multiracial coalitions. They had a confrontation with the police department, Eugene Police Department. In 1969, there were two major confrontations. First was centered around three BPP members and two Eugene police officers. It started when two EP Eugene police tried to enter a Panther member's house without a warrant. They were yelling insults and threatening to force their way to BPP members. Howard, Howard and Tommy Anderson met them. The BPP members were armed and ready to defend their rights as Americans. Captain asked the EP to produce a warrant and he would instruct the Panthers inside to come out and surrender. They could not produce such a warrant. They never experienced armed black men defending their rights under the United States Constitution. They ran to their car in shock and embarrassment. This is actually a rally at the University of Oregon, right outside Knight Library, if you recognize this construction there.
captioned Oliver Patterson, one of the Southern, perhaps uh, from outside of California. Tom H. Anderson is speaking at the microphone. Howard Anderson, captain. Bill Green, Jerome Foster, a few other folks like that. So one of the, the reasons for the attention with the police is that uh, the Panthers actually had taken to doing um, military style marches early in the morning with guns down the street. They're right, yeah. Peaceably assembled, armed or not. So the context of this confrontation, the Panthers had been conducting drills where members would get up early in the morning and make an effort to uh, march in armed formation around the campus community. As Jadja pointed out, Eugene had never experienced armed black men defending the rights on the U.S. Constitution, and there was still uh, a clan, active clan in Eugene as well. The Eugene clan still had its influence in the community, definitely in the police department. So, same day a warrant came out uh, against Howard and Tommy. Uh, members of the above ground part of the party showed up at the headquarters. They wouldn't give up the Anderson brothers without a fight to the death. Getting very dramatic, but headquarters was fortified. They had enough weapons to engage the police department in a firefight, but didn't come to that. And uh, there was a very supportive uh, Your American lawyer, uh, Mr. Morrow, who since, since died, who basically got them out. Ken Morrow, highly respected attorney in Eugene, walked up to the door, said his attorney would help, called the judge, asked if he could bring the members down to City Hall, had bail set. Bail was set as 10000 per Panther. The money was raised in, 20, in 10 minutes. So police continued harassment and uh, arrest Panthers for various reasons which is basically a similar experience all over the place. So the show was over in 1970. Um, people moved elsewhere. This uh, was the house, 1671 and a half pearl. Uh, even though I've captioned it as a contemporary picture, it is now student condos raised to the ground. So, the, um, I, I would normally have refer, COINTEL PRO means counterintelligence program, it's a U.S. intelligence community, that is FBI, CIA, etc. Uh, program uh, targeting uh, a number of uh, leftists and civil rights groups COINTELPRO targeted Panthers, played Panthers and us against each other using disinformation campaigns. Uh, Panthers knew that, uh, that the organization could uh, eventually be destroyed, so they created uh, what was referred to in one acronym, Community Revolution in Progress, which is basically a secret cell of the Panthers, which essentially eventually degenerated into a street gang after association with the Black Gorilla family. So not so much the association with Black Gorilla family, but the dehuman as uh, dehumanizing aspects of prison. And also deliberate counter-revolutionary organization and, and organizing and part of uh, prison authorities. So for example, the Aryan Brotherhood was organized by prison guards using prisoners against the Black Gorilla family and other organizations of color within prison. Black Guerrilla Family is a political group started at Soledad Prison by George Jackson, a revolutionary in prison for one year to life for a $70 gas station robbery. Uh, the Aryan Brother Prison Gang, again, created in support of, uh, in response to the BGF. Lord, yep. Lord, Lord, they shot George Jackson down. Right. 
Is that Dylan? That was Dylan, right? Yeah. So the other organization, Black Nationalist Organization, founded by Malana Ron Karenga, who's still alive, who created Kawaida theory, one third of which is the seven principles of blackness, the Nguza Saba or the seven days of Kwanzaa. Us, some say you, you might hear it referred to as United Slaves, was in rivalry with uh, the Black Panthers. It's been said that sets of bloods grew out of us membership. Uh, and you can basically see that in the acronym I'm about to show you. Uh, they weren't necessarily allied against the Panthers, but there was a COINTEL program to basically, uh, that you can see detailed in the Bastards of the Party that uh, was admitted to that the government actually tried to play the organizations off each other. Bloods as an acronym, Brotherly Love Overriding Oppression Defending Society. Which might be news to some Bloods in terms of their origin, but there it is. So, whatever the Crips and Bloods might have been, whether community revolution in progress, brotherly love, overriding oppression, defending society, any historical, political, cultural, spiritual influence was gone, destroyed by certain mainstream forces, so that the focus became basically addictive criminal. Ahistorical, that is no history, no recognition of what the history was, where they came from, what the beef was, or no political focus, either. It's strictly profit. So, the role modeling images were the 70s, the pimp and player, and eventually, you know, sports figures and rappers. So you have the basic meme of, well, the only way to make it is not working a square job, it is being a hustler, or, you know, a rapper, or a sports figure. The SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, Jesse Jackson. Uh, the prayer pilgrimage was one of the events. The second march on Washington. Uh, that put Martin Luther King on the map as far as the nation and the world were concerned. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, most famous for their lunch counter sit-ins and other activities where they did freedom rides, voting registration, um, anti-poverty education. So student meaning college students. CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. If you've seen the movie The Great Debaters, the young man Farmer started that, con helped found the Congress of Racial Equality, founded in 42 by an interracial group of students using the Sadi Graha tactics of Gandhi. Uh, they were civil rights pioneers, Brown v. Board, Montgomery Bus Gorkot, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman uh, were members of CORE. They were the uh, three civil rights workers. Uh, killed by the Klan and buried in a um, levy. Freedom Riders was also a core project. And so it's one of the big five civil rights organizations that organized the March on Washington and also was very much instrumental within the Eugene Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and 60s. The MOVE organization uh, surfaced in Philadelphia during the in 1970s characterized by dreadlock hair, the adopted surname Africa. They had a principled unity and an uncompromising commitment in, to their belief. The members practiced the teachings of MOVE founder John Africa. MOVE was and still is a multiracial organization and always had been, though portrayed as a radical black extremist. Uh, for example, John Africa, or it, it was, MOVE was often portrayed in the press as a radical black extremist organization, people who never bathe and live in filth. Yes, well, they did bathe, and the filth was compost piles for their organic garden in which they grew food and distributed free to the elderly. They had, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but... They got bombed. Yes. 
We'll get to that. Okay. So during their early 70s, they were based in Palestine and Village section of Philly. Members had a preference for hard physical work and constantly <laughs> chopping firewood, running dogs, shoveling snow, or sweeping the street. So when elderly and poor people had their heat shut off by the power company, move members would build and install wood stoves, hence the firewood, and distribute that free. Which, of course, city officials were not doing. They ran a popular car wash, helped homeless people find places to live, assisted the elderly with home repairs, intervened in violence between local street gangs and college fraternities, and helped incarcerated offenders meet parole requirements through a rehabilitation program that is a drug rehabilitation program. So these are not just unwashed, dirty thugs doing all this. So you can see, just like the Panthers, Okay, they're doing social work where the system isn't taking care of certain people. So these groups are organizing to take care of certain people themselves. And that in itself becomes a threat. After adopting Moo's way of natural living, many individuals overcame past problems of drug addiction, physical disability, infertility, and alcoholism. They move dissenting views as an opportunity to showcase their beliefs and sharpen their oratory skills, which they knew would be tested in the revolutionary struggle. In this sense, they're a lot like the precursors to Occupy, except a little more organized, I would say. They presented their views in public forums and lectures of noted authorities, including Dick Gregory, Alan Watts, Jane Fonda, Julian Bond, Richie Havens, um, the future Vice President Walter Mondale, Roy Wilkins, NAACP, Buckminster Fuller, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Cesar Chavez, and Russell Means. So this is actually from their website, obviously. None could refute John Africa's teachings. This is a quote, a move statement. If our profanity offends you, look around you and see how destructively society is profaning itself. It is the rape of the land, the pollution of the environment, the betrayal and suffering of the masses by corrupt government that is the real obscenity. So, the mainstream media had a long history of distorting move coverage using misquotes, unverified rumors, and biased stories. And those who actually met move members could see the the remarkable strength and health they exhibited, uh, dehumanizing news accounts <laughs> basically told essentially lies. So, they became a threat to the degree that uh, the police, uh, for example, Frank Rizzo, who was a police commissioner and eventually a uh, mayor, uh, was a key figure in uh, Philadelphia, and his first action as commissioner had been to halt a peaceful demonstration of 3,500 black high school students asking for educational reforms and black studies programs by basically unleashing police who charge with no provocation and basically chase students for blocks with billy clubs, etc. Many were beaten, uh, and eventually he parlayed um, that position into a higher political office. So eventually, uh, MOVE was bombed, as you pointed out, uh, in an incident that essentially uh, the government, police forces dropped incendiaries and not only bombed, burned up the MOVE house, but the entire block around them. On, so to speak. NAACP. Oops. Huh. Oh well. Put this down here. In 
NAACP started in uh, 1909 by W.E.B. Du Bois, the Nation of Islam, Black Mus also known as the Black Muslims, a religious group loosely following the tenets of Islam. In fact, the reason I'm saying loosely is um, Part of one of the requirements of Islam, besides is recognizing Prophet Muhammad as the last Rasul and basically focusing on the teachings of the Quran, uh, the Nation of Islam doesn't necessarily do that. Uh, they recognize uh, Elijah Muhammad as a semi prophet, which mainstream Islam is not down with that at all. So. Advocating black pride, self-help, economic and political personal self-reliance, racial separation, abstinence from drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Uh, they have a prison ministry and are active in community. Their most famous adherents include Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Minister Farrakhan, Benjamin Mohammed, formerly Ben Chavis of uh, Wilmington 10. Uh, the nation's place within the black community um, obviously can't be denied. They have uh, supplied a number of leaders, um, and there has been uh, schisms within the group, not only with Malcolm X, but also, for example, with the son of Elijah Muhammad, who has actually um, adopted a more traditional form of Islam uh, based on Quranic teachings rather than the teachings of his father. Uh, but they still exist today. Uh, in COBRA, National Association for uh, Blacks for Reparations, so it's the most well-known group uh, seeking uh, reparations for slavery. NMA, NDA, not NWA. Uh, you may or may not know this, but since I'm a son of black medical professionals, for a long time, the American Medical Association and the American Dental Association did not admit black people, did not admit black doctors. We've been training black doctors in this country for the better part of 150 years. So they had to form their own professional organizations. So National Medical Association, which you could read as Negro, but they were open to having whites as part of their organization and did and the National Dental Association. So professional associations founded by black doctors and dentists, open membership, okay, not to be confused with NWA. Julius Nair, African Socialism. So he was a Niger uh, not Nigerian, he's a Tanzanian economist who proposed the concept of Ujamaa or African Socialism renamed uh, by Ron Karenga within Kawaida's Cooperative Economics. Nyeri believed that socialism was the natural economic system in Africa, which predated capitalism and colonialism, and unlike Karl Marx, believed that it was based on spiritual principles that con condemned exploitation based on racism and sexism. So the African, well, African socialism basically rests on three principles. The first, Spirituality. Second, non racism as they say, non racialism, and third, non sexualism. So I we would Americanize those as anti racism and anti sexist, but based on spiritual principles first. So as an example with within the African framework, there's no real estate because you can only own that which you created. You didn't create the land, but you can create crops and mine minerals by your own hand, but the land itself belongs to the people, not any one person. What was the third principle? Spirituality, anti-racism, anti-sexism. Karl Marx believed that Religion was the opiate of the, of the masses. So. And he also had some racist, white supremacist tendencies too. So, hence Nyeri. 
basically saying socialism or what was referred to in English as socialism. Actually, Marx is even talking about what socialism is by observing uh, Native American nations, for, for example, Iroquois Six Nations, where they don't believe in real estate either. And they also don't believe in hier social hierarchies. OAU, the Organization of African Unity, an attempt to create a United States of Africa organized for African interests against colonialist, post-colonialist, Cold War powers, and multinational powers, which multinationals obviously are not countries, but they're corporations that wield influence. Al-Hajj al-Malik Shabazz, the king of the Shabazz, which is what that means, who has completed the Hajj. This is a picture of Malcolm in the Cairo Mosque. So every devout Muslim must make the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, once in their life at least. When Mal well, Malcolm did, making more than one pilgrimage, he noticed that there were white European Muslims who treated him differently than racist Americans. This was counter to the experience that he experienced within the Nation of Islam and the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, who basically said, well, whites are devils. And so, in traditional Islam, racism is considered a sin. Is that when they started to part ways? Definitely, when they started to part ways. So, he started looking at, okay, this is, you know, I'm experiencing, you know, this treat, you know, I'm being treated as a brother by these white European Muslims. That he's been and that's what Malcolm, trained that were and, evil. And yeah, that he would, had been trained by Elijah Muhammad to see that they were evil, plus some things with uh, that evidence co corruption by Elijah Muhammad. So he started breaking away uh, from that. And basically, what I'm leading up to, so he began to see that not all white men were evil racists, and he began to change his views. So part of that change was to look at making alliances with the civil rights movement that he had previously alienated himself from, including Martin Luther King, among others, as well as give uh, American blacks an international following. So part of what this did is made him a target. And COINTELPRO, one of COINTELPRO's stated objectives is basically to prevent the rise of a black messiah. So for that part of that fear in terms of Malcolm, so he creates, when he breaks with the Nation of Islam, he creates the Organization of African American Unity. So it's created by Malcolm after the Hajj to unite both Africans in America with Africans in Africa, to unite both with national and international civil rights movements and other racial groups. So he created that after he broke with the Nation of Islam, and it, it basically lived after his assassination for about eight months. But this agenda, that is can, uniting Africans in Af America with Africans in Africa, as well as other movements, would be carried on by other uh, groups. So for example, the Black Panthers, who considered themselves heir to uh, Malcolm's efforts in this particular area. So, fear of a black messiah. It's a man capable of uniting black America into a politically, economically, and culturally viable force. So, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Paul Robeson, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, Yeshua in the center. So, it's been the policy of the United States to discredit destroy, deport, or assassinate any African-American male or any organization capable of uniting black America. It's been the official policy, stated or not, but COINTELPRO is only one most famous means of doing that. Urban League a black mainstream organization founded with the assistance of the Rockefeller family, which focuses mostly on economic development with corporate assistance. So, prelude to the 70s. 
so the assassination of Malcolm X in 65, August 65, the Watts riots, 66, the birth of the Black Panther Party, uh, Martin Luther King's speech, anti-war speech at Riverside a year before his assassination. Then he's assassinated a year later with governmental assistance. Riots in response to his assassination, 68 Olympics, formation of um, black power movement. Etc. If you make armed revolution impossible, you make violent revolution inevitable. There should be a revolution every 20 years. So this is the Watts riots, which I was 10 at the time, passed uh, two blocks away from my house. Turn left or get shot is what the sign says in the caption. So 64 seemed to mark a turning point in America with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. New age and race relations appeared to be dawning, but the states acted quickly to go around the new federal law. California reacted with Proposition 14, which moved to block the fair housing components of the Civil Rights Act. This and other acts created a feeling of injustice and despair in inner cities. In August of 65, a routine traffic stop, note that phrase, in South Central provided the spark that lit the fire of those feelings. The riots lasted for six days, leaving 34 dead, over 1,000 people injured, nearly 4,000 arrested, and hundreds of buildings destroyed. After the riots, then Governor Pat Brown named John McCone to head a commission to study the riots. The commission concluded that the riots were an act of thugs, but a symptom of a much deeper problem, high jobless rate, poor housing, bad schools. And although the problems clearly pointed out in the report, no effort was made to address them or to rebuild what had been destroyed in the riots. And then there's various reports that basically second that. Bayard Rustin with uh, Martin Luther King in Los Angeles in August 65, Martin calling for a calm and nonviolence. And then Martin's assassination. Two minutes? All right. So, the Martin that you don't see on television. So, early in the term, if you might, might recall, that I made the parallel between uh, the Romans and Jesus and the United States and Martin Luther King. Uh, what I don't have time to present in the next two minutes, but I will just kind of set up for uh, next week. So every year we have this whole image about Martin Luther King that we trot out the I have a dream speech and nonviolence. So the familiar file footage, King battling desegregation in Birmingham, deciding his dream of racial harmony, marching for voting rights, and then finally lying dead in the motel balcony. So there's three years. It's usually dropped from the historical record in terms of his focus. civil rights issue. So, his last years are totally missing as if it were, it never happened. So basically, they're not talking about, say, for example, since all his speeches were filmed or taped, he basically focused on economic injustice and the war in Vietnam basically contributing to economic injustice. So when he focused on legalized discrimination, the me major media were his allies. After the passage of civil rights, he st began challenging fundamental priorities, particularly economic ones. 
Civil rights laws were empty without human rights, including economic rights. Were people too poor to eat at a restaurant or afford a decent home? Anti-discrimination laws were hollow. So we'll look at those discrimination laws and the remedies for them next week. Online. Learn. Unlearn.